Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Am I audible, sir? Good morning, sir. Am I audible, sir? Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Am I audible, sir? Good morning, sir. Am I start? Good morning, Dharani. Good morning, sir. Can I start the presentation, sir? Yeah, yes, please. So today's uh, topic for this uh, discussion is sterilization and operation theater. Just a moment. So it could hang just a moment, sir. Uh, today's topic for discussion is uh, sterilization and operation theater. So, coming to operation theater complex, uh, it is a scientifically planned one. Uh, it acts as a barrier system. Uh, it should be located away from the inpatient area, preferably on the top floor. So, it consists of uh, four zones. Uh, first one is the outer zone. Here, it has areas for receiving patients, messengers, uh, toilets, and uh, administrative functions. Uh, second one is the restricted zone, and also known as clean zone. It has areas for a changing room, store room, anesthetist room, patient transfer room, nursing staff room, and recovery room. Third one is the uh, aseptic room. It has a scrub area, preparation room, operation theater, area for instrument packing and sterilization. And fourth one is disposable zone. Here, the area which is used 
equipment are clean and biohazardous waste are disposed. Uh, operation room should be uh, big enough uh, for a free ventilation. It should be having two openings, that is, towards the one towards the scrub area and one towards the sterile area. The opening should be fitted with swing doors. Uh, OR room should be of uh, marble or polished uh, stone flooring. It has it should be having glazed tight walls and also there shouldn't be any wall ceiling. Uh, operation room asepsis should have a uh, three components that is cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, which are considered to be the cornerstones in asepsis. First is cleaning. It is a form of decontamination. It simply removes the organic matter and visible soils that interfere with the action of disinfectant. It reduces the bacterial count to some extent. It involves scrubbing with detergents and rinsing with the water. Next comes the disinfection by phenol. Uh, it's also known as uh, carbolic acid 2 percentage. It is used for washing floor every time after the surgery. It is used for mopping, operation room, walls, over tables, mats, trolleys, and stools. And it is followed by a wipe done with 70% of alcohol. Formaldehyde is commonly used for uh, sterilizing the operation theater. For an every 1,000 cubic feet, the requirement for fumigation is 500 ml of 40% formaldehyde in 1 liter of water. Stove or hot plate is used for heating the formalin. And also 300 ml of 10% of ammonia. Procedure of fumigation is, you should close all the doors and windows airtight and switch off fans and AC. Heat formalin solution should be boiled till dry. Leave the OT unentered over the night and enter the operation room next day morning with 300 ml of ammonia. Keep the ammonia solution for two to three hours to neutralize the formalin vapors and open the operation theater to start the surgery. This fumigation should be done at every week. So commercially av available disinfectant are uh, Bacillage special. It is a surface and environmental disinfectant. Along with the cleansing property, it also has bactericidal, viricidal, and sporicidal and fungicidal activity. Each 100 gram contains 1.6 uh, dihydroxyl, deuteraldehyde, pencil alkonian chloride, alkyl urea derivatives. It should be sprayed or mopped liberally, allowing for 30 minutes of contact time. So uh, this cleaning consists of a three bucket system in which first bucket is with water, that is a dirty mop is rinsed. Second bucket is with fresh water for rinsing. Uh, where mop is rinsed again in this water. Third bucket is with lower level infected, disinfectant, where mop is immersed in the solution and floor is mopped liberally. Again, continue with the first bucket with water. So this wash the used mop with disinfectant after use and dry thoroughly before the reuse. This is a pictorial diagram showing the three bucket system, which involves water and water for rinsing, and third one is a bacillus solution. So advantages are, it provides complete asepsis within 30 to 60 uh, minutes. Uh, cleaning with detergent or carbolic acid is not required. And formalin fumigation also is not required. Uh, so shutdown of uh, operation for 24 hours is also not required. Next comes the ultraviolet uh, radiation. We have to uh, use this uh, UV ra radiation for a uh, daily basis for uh, 12 to 16 hours. And it should be switched off two hours before surgery. So instruments need through uh, thorough cleaning after every operation and before next sterilization. Cleaning should be done either manually or mechanically. Uh, cleaning can be done using ultrasonic cleaner here. Uh, microsurgical instruments and instruments with injured areas and serrated edges can be cleaned. The principle used in ultrasonic cleaner is uh, sound waves pass at a frequency of uh, 1 lakh hertz or more in the liquid, which generate sub-microscopic bubbles, which then collapse, creating a negative pressure on the particles in the suspension. So uh, this cleaner disintegrates bacteria and protein matter is completely coagulated by this action. It is not recommended for telescope, endoscopes, or other illuminated devices. It's a vectorial diagram showing ultrasonic cleaner. So followed by arrangement of uh, instrument, uh, we have to arrange the instruments in trays, uh, thereby Heavy instruments are placed at the bottom of the tray, and also signal black uh, indicator is in placed inside the tray. Uh, we have to double wrap the instruments with the lin linen, and also another uh, signal black indicator with date label should be kept outside the pack also. So sterilization is a complete destruction of all microorganisms, both vegetative forms and their spores. So agents available are uh, steam under pressure uh, autoclave, Ethylene oxide, known as ETO, high level disinfectant and irradiation. So, uh, autoclave is a type of steam sterilization where 
uh, it is suitable for sterilization of most, most of the metallic instruments except sharp knives and fine scissors. Autoclaving at uh, 121 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes at 15 lbs uh, pressure square inches pressure effectively kills most of the organisms and spores. The types of autoclaves are uh, gravity displacement type, free vacuum type, and vertical or horizontal type. This is an example for a vertical type of uh, autoclave, an example for horizontal type of autoclave. So various stages in process of autoclaving are, uh, first we have to load the uh, instruments and close the lid, and we have to allow for air removal and begin the uh, steam exposure. And uh, it has a holding time for about uh, 20 minutes, and we have to allow the instrument to uh, dry for about 15 to 20 minutes. Then finally, unload the instruments. This effectively kills the microorganism and their spores. So in, it's another thing called flash uh, sterilization in case of emergency situation where 132 degrees Celsius at uh, 30 LBS of pressure is applied for three minutes. So testing for the efficacies, biological and chemical indicators are used to monitor the sterilization. Here, biological indicators containing the bacterial spores are used for monitoring the efficacy of the sterilizers. So chemical, commercially available spore strips impregnated with the spores of Bacillus stereothermophilus, which is a heat, heat, heat stable uh, bacteria. The spore strips are inserted in the cold compartment of the autoclave, which is the lowest part of the chamber. After autoclaving the load of the strips, uh, aseptically transferred to the triptychase soy broth and are incubated at 50 degrees Celsius for five days. Uh, then uh, comes the kills microorganism by altering the DNA by alkylation. Uh, it uh, widely used for uh, re-sterilization the package heat sensitive devices. Uh, uh, since ETO is uh, alternative for the autoclave, uh, effective and safe for heat label tubings, uh, cryoprobes, light pipes, laser probes, and diathermy. An example: This is a picture showing the ethylene oxide system. So, typical ETO sterilization cycle includes packaging of articles to be sterilized and air removal with vacuum pump. Heating is required to about 45 to uh, 55 degrees Celsius. Steam humidification is maintained at the relative humidity of 60 percentage. So, exposure of ethylene oxide at five uh, pressure square inch for 12 hours or 10. Uh, PSA for six hours. Air is flushed by a filtered air and is repeated four times to re-establish the atmospheric pressure. So a good amount of aeration is uh, needed to elude the residual ETU. Uh, then, then comes uh, gamma radiation. It is suitable for the instruments uh, that that are cannot be autoclaved and sharp cutting instrument, plastic, rubber, and items of spores. Effective against the vegetative pathogens in 15 minutes and resistant patho pathogenic spores in three hours. However, uh, it is not so, uh, it should not should be thoroughly rinsed serially two to three times in trays filled with sterile water, and it is not recommended for lumen containing instruments such as uh, irrigating uh, cannula as the residual glutaridate, even after rinsing, causes endothelial cell damage. Then comes the gamma radiation. Here it is the uh, cold sterilization, it is also known as cold sterilization. It has high penetrating power. Uh, it is little to DNA, uh, no appreciable rise in temperature, most useful for disposable and rubber items as well as linger lactate. So microbiology monitoring is done by uh, swabbing and culture for bacteria in operation theater. It should be done once in a month. That is, area swab in all OT, that is operation table at the head end, over the headlamp, four walls, and floor uh, below the head end of the table, uh, instrument trolley, AC duct and microscope handles. These are the areas that uh, swab is needed. Uh, quality of air in operation theater is, uh, is monitored by settled plate method. It is, should be done once in a month. Here, one plate of blood agar and uh, saborodextrose agar is placed in the center of the operation theater, uh, close to the operation table, and lid is kept open for 30 minutes. Then both the agas are incubated at 27 degree Celsius for seven days, and colony counts of bacteria and fungi are reported. Bacterial colony count of more than 10 per plate and fungal colony more than one per plate are considered unacceptable. So microbiology department sends out the reports to operation data and maintains the record of the same. So hand washing, 
technique here uh, we have to remove the uh, watch and other jewelries and we have to use aqua water for uh, hand washing turn the tap using the elbow uh, wet hands from the tips to elbow holding up to uh, enable the water to run down from finger to elbow so apply soap and scrub each hand with other so use of uh, rotatory movements from fingertips to elbow with special attention to nails and webs of the fingers and rinse thoroughly under the running water in same manner as above and scrub should be done for at least 7 to 8 minutes so this are the pictorial diagram showing uh, white white area shows uh, it's not missed frequently and red areas especially in the web space and the thumb region uh, are mostly missed areas again uh, we are we have to uh, use powder and iodine for uh, and for washing the hands and it should be done twice is adequate uh, we have to close the tap with the elbow taking care not to touch any spot that has been scrubbed so and after that dry with sterile towel begin with hands and proceed to wrist front forearm uh, alcohol or iodoform can be used following the surgical scrub and approximately 3 to 5 ml of alcohol for 5 minutes is rubbed until the hands are dry So after the uh, scrubbing, we have to use a proper uh, sterile gloves without any perforation. And after wearing the sterile gloves, wash hands with uh, balanced salt solution or ringer lactate to remove tack from the gloves. Then uh, use of sterile drapes to cover the uh, face and isolate eyelashes and lid margins to reduce the passage of microorganism to, into the eye. Irrigating fluids, then uh, here intravenous fluids such as uh, BSS ringer lactate should be inspected for intact packing and for any obvious bacterial or fungal contamination. Any visible particulate matter should render a bottle unsafe for use, even if it is sterile packing seems undisturbed. So operating room environment as not only as sterile and non-sterile areas as well as sterile and non-sterile personnel. So sterile uh, operating room personnel includes Surgeon, surgeon, surgical assistant, scrub nurse, and non sterile OR personnel include anesthesiologist, circulating nurse, and uh, technologist or observer. So, checklists that should be done pre operatively uh, with the patient, such as uh, patient's name, condition, consent, uh, and marked site, all investigations available and pre existing complications. Operating room should have ideal uh, temperature and humidity. Here, patients are at risk of becoming hypothermic during the prolonged operation, such as uh, paralysis. Uh, cool intravenous uh, fluid uh, infusion or large exposed wounds will add up to the potential problem. So to prevent the hypothermia, ambient temperature of about uh, 24 to 20 degrees Celsius are recommended. Here, most of the surgeons find such temperature uncomfortable and fatigue quickly. So ideal working temperature for surgeons is between the 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. So for a prolonged operation, patients warming blanket should be used. Uh, this is especially important for uh, small children. Uh, and also there should be relative impurity in theatre should be capable of adjustment of range of 40 to 60 percentage. Operation room should have a good amount of illumination. The light shows in the theatre should produce, should not produce a shadow and it should be able, capable of uh, producing a minimum of 40,000 lux at the incision site. Uh, the good airflow system keeps the air fresh and it is measured by the number of air changes per hour. That is, minimum standard number of airflow changes allowed in operating room should be 17 per hour. However, the laminar flow will generate 100 to 300 air changes per hour and it is used in the operation in which airborne infections are completely avoided. Uh, the movement, all stops should enter the theater through entry zone, which is used for scrubbing and gowning. The amount of movement in and around the operating room and table should itself should be kept minimum. There should be those clearly marked for exit and entry and one-way traffic will minimize the risk of contamination. And airborne uh, contamination uh, in theater originate almost exclusively from the personnel within the theater. That is, uh, each person may shed 3,000 to 3,000 microorganisms per minute. So, the major source is the skin. However, it is contaminated with the staph aureus and uh, coagulus negative staphylococcal species. The bacteria also disperse from the upper respiratory tract. So, how to avoid it? Uh, we have to avoid excessive or unnecessary movements, operating room overcrowding, poor scrubbing or gowning, uh, gowning or gloving technique, uh, poor airflow, inappropriate temperature and humidity. So coming to surgical asepsis uh, and principles of surgical asepsis, skin preparation agents, antiseptics such as chlorhexidine or uh, 
codein iodine is applied to the surgical site prior to the incision reduce the number of resident uh, organism antiseptic containing alcohol must be allowed to evaporate completely before using the dithorn so all the objects used in the sterile fluid must be sterile that check for packages for sterility by assessing intactness dryness and expiry date prior to the use any torn previously opened or wet packaging or packaging that has been dropped on the floor is considered non sterile a sterile object becomes unsterile when touched by a unsterile object whenever the sterility of the object is questionable then consider it is a unsterile one the fluid flows in the direction of gravity so keep the tips of the forceps down during the sterile procedure to prevent fluid traveling from entire forceps and potentially contaminating the sterile fluid sterile items that are uh, below the waist level are uh, considered to be unsterile so keep all the sterile equipments or uh, instruments and gloves above the waist level and table drapes or only should be above the waist level sterile fluids must always be kept inside of considered sterile so never turn your back on the sterile fluid as sterility cannot be guaranteed when opening sterile equipment and adding supplies to the sterile fluid taking we have to take care to avoid contamination set up sterile trays as close to the time of use as possible place items on the sterile fluid using sterile gloves or a sterile transfer forceps sterile objects can become unsterile by prolonged exposure to the airborne microorganisms any puncture or tear that passes through the sterile barrier must be considered contaminated so keep sterile surface dry or replace it if it's wet or torn once the sterile field is set up the border of the 1 inch at the edge of the sterile table is considered unsterile so place all object inside the sterile field and away from 1 inch border if there is any doubt about the sterility of an object it is considered unsterile no sterility must be maintained throughout the procedure sterile process or sterile objects may may only contact sterile areas non sterile persons or items contact only non sterile areas so front of the sterile gown is sterile be between the shoulder and waist and from the sleeve to the 2 inches below the elbow unsterile items should not cross over the sterile fluid for example unsterile person should not reach over the sterile fluid finally movement around or in in the sterile fluid must be uh, must not compromise or contaminate the sterile fluid so we should not sneeze uh, cough laugh or uh, talk over the sterile fluid maintain a safe space or margin of safety between the sterile and unsterile object and areas keep the operating room uh, room traffic to minimum and keep the door closed and also keep the tire at tight back thank you uh, thank you darani uh, uh, take home message would be more uh, useful when when you finish you always uh, give a sum up of important salient points so you did cover majority of uh, can you can you just sum up in brief about in five to six points what you would like to convey to all the fellows here regarding sir, sir, uh, sir uh, first is a uh, area for zones so we have to get uh, have a good uh, 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 knowledge about the area of uh, uh, sterility sterility sir that uh, the one is uh, it is divided into four zones uh, and uh, we have to know which is the uh, sterile and the non sterile areas and minimum of 1 inch of uh, uh, border uh, border uh, spaces are needed for uh, sterile packaging and in case of uh, like uh, sterilizing the operation theater three uh, three components uh, involved that is cleaning disinfectant and the sterilization okay and uh, one is the ot environment zoning and flow flow of uh... the personnel instruments everything must be uh, in a chain usually uh, structuring must be such that that uh, the flow is from from sterile area and sterile things go in, in, uh, out in a different way so modern ot is uh, usually function that way where uh, it, it's not back and forth through the same now would always they prefer having two doors enter entry to exit through other door uh practically that will be a lot of difficulties in such systems but uh, that's the recommendation so uh, it's a one way path throughout all systems where you enter through one way uh, sterile do things sterile go out through the unsterile things both personnel as well as instruments everything 
uh, space will be a constraint. So that's the uh, one uh, thing which you left out, I think. Then um, personally, you talked about hand washing and other things. How many minutes is the current recommendation for a hand wash? Uh, sir, uh, for initial day of uh, surgery, it is a seven seven minutes, sir. Then followed by it is uh, said that two to three minutes. Sir. Hmm. What does the evidence say? Sir, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, like different uh, different tables says different timings, sir. Uh, like, uh, one minute uh, is sufficient enough if done properly. About uh, two minutes, so if it's the second time, if it's yes, uh, not the first day of the case. Mm, first day of the case, uh, five minutes uh, is recommended. Then um, you did uh, you didn't uh, tell about doning, doffing. I mean, blinding the clothes. All basics, which uh, again is very important. And you did talk about the uh, culture plates. Uh, all that is a strong recommendation. We all do that strictly over here. Uh, and because of NABH, it's more, much more is done than what is seen. So if at all you see a growth in the culture plates which you mentioned, right? So yes, what sir. do you do? Sir, we have to again uh, do all the sterilization, fumigation sterilization again, another process completely. So again, we have to check for the culture plate to go, go negative, sir. Till that, we have to go, go ahead and do fumigation, sir. Correct. But the culture plate reports will take four to seven days to come. Okay, so, okay, so those are small because we cannot we clean it and we cannot wait for seven days to still start using theta. So those are small practical difficulties which we are facing because it, we have to wait for seven days for the culture to come back. So that's one thing which you uh, cannot afford to wait. And those are pra small practical difficulties which we are facing. And uh, that practical difficult. I mean, currently we were trying to reduce the number of uh, door openings. Sir had done some work on it. Uh, sir, your point, sir. Yeah, I I uh, I asked uh, uh, and to find out how many times uh, the door is uh, open during a particular surgery. Um, uh, they 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 took uh, five representative cases of totally replacement. And during which time they found that uh, looking at the CCD, applying it, found that uh, the minimum of 60 times uh, the door was kept, was open to due to various reasons. And the maximum was 75 times the door was open and shut. Um, so uh, mainly it's a planning. And every time some little, little things are being brought from outside because uh, they had not kept them inside then the traffic the anesthesia side and the, and and the nurses side the traffic is what uh, is uh, happening so essentially uh, we can get a telephone and no problem in that but essentially it's a, uh, it's a culture is it's a, our attitude and uh, has to uh, change and uh, I have requested Dr. Uh, Yuvarajan to come out with an action plan what all should be done in order to remain and keep the door closed and I say, basically I think that uh, the nurses in charge of the theatre do not function as if they are in charge they are so subdued in various hospitals, and they are here also they are subdued. Yesterday, I was noticing Dr. Palni was giving anesthesia spinal for a person, and the who is uh, looking from behind very intently. One of this uh, pink dress uh, industry guy, you know, who brought a lot of things, and he's very intently looking how it is being done. There's no need for him to come in at all, and. Um, Maliga was a nurse and she was just looking down. So we all our attitude has to change. Only then we'll be successful in keeping the uh, theater sterile. And another point I want to know, the, what about the solution with which we clean the theater? Is Dharani uh, said the particular 
solution that we use or is something different? So bacilloids are uh, solutions. Rasantosh, uh, is that what we use now? Sir, we use, uh, I mean, that's a standard. I'm not sure of the formula. That's the standard uh, NABH recommendations. They came and saw what the like, specific solution. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a it's a company name, but uh, I'm not sure of the chemical composition. But it's a standard. That's a standard thing it's used. Okay. Uh, there are various categories. What we use is something which is, I mean, uh, the smell-wise, uh, this is the least. Uh, Order-wise, the least is the one which we are using. Which is a standard thing. The anesthetic is in this meeting today? No, sir. Oh. And that, that uh, meeting we had earlier on a Sunday morning, well, that has to be given to the nurses as well as uh, fellows to uh, play. We will have to ask Vanita to do that. Uh, that is a wealth of information. <laughs> Synthesis organized meeting has been. Yeah. Okay. What's okay. Cironix? Cironix. Synthesis organized one base. Cironix did one before that. Mm. Both will have to do. Yeah. yeah. We'll go on next one. Good morning, sir. I'll be presenting on the sterilization techniques. I'll start off with the definitions, as Dr. Dharani has said. Sterilization means the any process by which all living microorganisms, including the bacterial spores, are destroyed from the surface. And disinfection means any process that destroys or removes all pathogenic organisms except bacterial spores. And cleaning is the process by which uh, all adherent visible soil, blood, proteinaceous substance, and debris or dust are removed from a foreign material before the process of uh, disinfection of sterilization. So uh, next, coming to sterility assurance level, uh, sterilization by definition means removal of all microorganisms, including bacterial spores. Practically, we can never be sure that uh, substance is uh, rid of all microorganisms. So for practical purposes, we have kept that any uh, level of microorganisms less than one in one million is referred to as sterile. So the SAL value of uh, 10 raised to minus 6, uh, which is quoted as 6. So SAL value of 6 is equivalent to sterility, which means there is less than 1 in 1 million chance that a single viable organism may persist. And for disinfection, that value is uh, 3. SAL value is 3. That means 10, 10 raised to 3 low colony forming units of microorganisms may be persisting. Next, the order of resistance of uh, organisms. The most resistant organism being prions, uh, next being bacterial spores, which can be destroyed by sterilization. And the least uh, resistant or the most susceptible organism being enveloped viruses, like HIV uh, uh, hepatitis B. So uh, the classification of different types of uh, disinfectants they can be classified into lower level, intermediate level, and high level. Lower level disinfectants cannot even destroy non-enveloped vi viruses. They can only destroy enveloped viruses, which are very weak, or fungi, or vegetative bacteria. Intermediate level can destroy non-enveloped viruses as well as uh, tubercle bacilli, but not bacterial spores. High level disinfectants can may, may destroy bacterial spores on prolonged exposure. But with routine exposure time, they also won't destroy bacterial spores and know uh, how to decide which steril whether sterilization or disinfection has to be done for specific medical uh, equipments. So Spalding has classified medical devices into critical, semi-critical, and non-critical devices. Critical device means any device, any surgical instrument or implant which directly comes into contact with blood, viscera, 
or uh, inside the joints or any normally uh, sterile site so all our instruments all our surgical instruments our implants uh, uh, our arthroscope everything comes under the uh, label of critical devices so they need sterilization or at least high level disinfectant but sterilization is always preferred in case of semi critical devices which come into contact with intact mucous membranes or minor skin breaches like your uh, endoscopes or laryngoscopes they can be uh, high level disinfectants may suffice for semi critical devices so it is not necessary that they should always undergo sterilization and non critical devices which directly come into contact with only intact skin like our bp cuff or stethoscope they need only intermediate level or even low level disinfectants so next coming to decontamination cycle so uh, after uh, instrument is used we should first clean that means uh, uh, removal of all the physical debris from the uh, instrument which then undergoes disinfection then inspection for any remaining uh, debris then it undergoes packaging which then finally goes on for sterilization and then storage this is the decontamination cycle that we go through now coming to uh, classification of different sterilization methods there are various number of sterilization methods starting from uh, our bare sunlight which works by uv rays to gas sterilization so the most important sterilization methods that we use on our day to day practice for our instruments and implants include the uh, moist heat sterilization which uh, which uses temperature above 100 degrees celsius which is autoclave then uh, our uh, gas sterilization methods like uh, ethylene oxide and plasma sterilization so i'll be talking in detail about these uh, sterilization methods but the other methods are sunlight drying heat application dry heat as well as moist heat filtration by membrane filters radiation by ionizing gamma rays gamma ray sterilization is also a cold sterilization method which we use for uh, sterilizing our implants and ultrasonic vibration and gas sterilization coming to disinfection disinfection methods there are uh, many chemicals which can be used for disinfection including alcohol aldehydes phenolic compounds halogens heavy metals dyes but again among these the most common ones that we use for our instruments include the formaldehyde which comes as the formalin and 2% glutar glutaraldehyde which uh, comes as sidex so i'll be talking in detail about these two also uh first coming to autoclave so the uh, autoclave works by moist heat sterilization which uh, goes above 100 degrees celsius the principle being it follows the laws of gas general laws of gas so at normal pressure at atmosphere pressure the water boils at 100 degrees celsius so if we increase the atmospheric pressure above 100 above our normal atmospheric pressure the boiling point at which the water turns into steam increases so the uh, contents the uh, saturated steam has more penetrating power so what we do is inside a closed chamber we increase the pressure so much so that the uh, boiling point of water increases and it turns into condensed steam which contains much more heat so it has more penetrating power and more uh, the uh, the heat of the steam can also be increased by increasing the pressure that is how uh, an autoclave works the basic principle so for example if you have 1600 ml of steam at 100 degrees celsius and one atmospheric pressure it is equivalent to just one ml of water at 100 degrees celsius and it releases pi 18 calories of heat so this the large reduction of volume when it condenses to water by releasing this much amount of heat it will create more vacuum and it will suck in more steam so that again it can be condensed to water and released it releases more heat which is which penetrates all the uh, materials that we want to sterilize so it provides very high amount of heat so the different phases of sterilization using an autoclave include the uh, pre treatment phase or the heat up cycle which basically means we are exposing we are expelling all the uh, air and creating vacuum and then we introduce steam so the sterilization phase the what we do is we increase the pressure so much so that the temp temperature is uh, increased at which the water turns into steam and that steam will have large amount of temperature and heat which is uh, supplied to the uh, instrument or the implant that we want to sterilize so then the post treatment phase includes the depressurization depressurize, de cycle where the steam or the vapor is condensed water is removed by vacuum and the goods are dried finally so the temperature at what i was telling is the temperature of uh, 15 psi the boiling point becomes 121 and then the time required will be 15 minutes but when we increase the pressure subsequently to 20 or 30 the temperature at which the steam uh, is generated 
gets more so the temp- the heat inside the steam also increases up to 134 degrees celsius which then requires only 3 minutes for sterilization so autoclave is one of the most commonly used sterilization methods in all hospitals we, we, the, the the advantage being it is very safe the by products produced are only steam there are no toxic by products that are being produced so it is very effective it is cheap also cheaper when compared to other methods and it provides excellent penetration into substances and it is the by products are safe but the disadvantage is being it cannot be used on heat sensitive uh, instruments like what we used in uh, our case the, the arthroscope or any the camera can never be autoclave because it will get damaged because of the high amount of heat that we are applying and also it causes corrosion and it damages plastic uh, heat sensitive substances so it cannot be autoclave so the other uses being surgical instruments culture media any autoclavable plastic containers uh, bio hazardous waste glass sphere which are autoclave susceptible all these can be autoclave next the precautions to be taken when we are uh, autoclaving so autoclave should not be used for sterilizing waterproof materials because uh, when we con- the con- steam high concentrated steam when it condenses it actually releases water onto the instrument so if you use a waterproof material it will get damaged and heat sensitive materials also should not be used and when the materials are loaded it should not it, sh- it should have if it, enough space for efficient steam penetration so you should not overfill the chamber material should be kept in such a way that it just it has enough space in between them and uh, polyethylene trays also should not be used as it may cause uh, melting and damage this is a typical uh, autoclave which has a pressure chamber where the pressure is increased and high uh, highly uh, saturated steam is generated and we have an electrocute heat heater at the lower part and the lid which closes it and increases the pressure so the main three parts are the lid pressure chamber and the electrical heater and the steam jacket through which the steam goes next coming to ethylene oxide so i've told about all the disadvantages of uh, autoclave so we go on to the next common uh, sterilization method being ethylene oxide this is a gaseous sterilization method ethylene oxide is a highly inflammable irritant explosive and carcinogenic gas but so because of all these properties it is supplied in a 10 to 20% concentration which is mixed with inert gases like co2 or dichloro dichloromethane so it lessens the toxicity of a pure <coughs> ethylene oxide gas this also has extremely high penetration power and even it penetrates plastic wraps also but the problem with uh, uh, the the action of eth- ethylene oxide is by alkylation alkylation means it replaces the hydrogen atom in a uh, living organism with alkyl groups like uh, methyl groups ch3 groups or ch c2h6 groups whichever alkyl groups are present in the uh, ethylene oxide the uh, alkyl groups actually replace the hydrogen atom in the microorganism and denatures the dna protein and rna and this kills the microorganism that is the mechanism of action of uh, eto so the effectiveness of eto is influenced by four essential parameters the gas concentration which should be 450 to 1200 mg per liter temperature of 29 to 65 degree celsius humidity of 45 to 85 percent exposure time of 2 to 5 hours so if you uh, look carefully at these parameters you can understand that the te- maximum temperature that it goes to is only 65 degree celsius and that starts from 29 degree celsius so it it doesn't have too much uh, heating when we are sterilizing it so the, all the heat sensitive equipments can be actually sterilized by eto that is the main advantage of ethylene oxide and the exposure time is just 2 to 5 hours uh, exposure time is 2 uh, to 5 hours for the eto but even if the exposure time is only 2 to 5 hours the a uh, total time required for sterilization by eto will be more because it is a highly toxic gas so the extensive aeration is required post sterilization so that the ethylene oxide which is absorbed by the absorbent surfaces should be expelled so extreme aeration for up to 8 hours has to be done so that the toxicity of the substance which is uh, which has absorbed ethylene oxide reduces so this it takes more time when we have to do eto that is one of the uh, disadvantages of eto so but the temperature remains very less so the advantages are for eto we can uh, use heat sensitive equipments like photographic equipments our uh, arthroscope or camera electrical equipments flexible fiber endoscopes catheters all these uh, whichever is heat sensitive plastic 
and uh, which are uh, which includes a camera arthroscope everything can be sterilized using an ethylene oxide but the disadvantage is are it is very time consuming so even if you uh, finish the ethylene oxide cycle by 5 to 6 hours it has to be aerated for the toxicity to come down so it will take at least more than uh, 12 to 16 hours for a efficient clearing of uh, the gases after doing uh, ethylene sterilization and it re- the other side effect being it uh, it releases toxic metabolites like ethylene oxide so you cannot come in a direct contact with ethylene oxide at all it is carcinogenic and it is fairly costly when compared to autoplaning and the precautions that has to be taken when we are using ethylene oxide so uh, we have to while unloading the sterilizer once the sterilization has been done immediately after the cycle the door should be opened 5 to 10 cm and all the personnel should leave the area for 15 minutes or otherwise the sterilizer should have a purge system that forces the gas out of the chamber forcefully into an exhaust so that nothing comes into the room but usually for normally uh, eto the uh, door has to be open 5 to 10 cm and the gas has to be let out while the all the personnel leaves the room immediately for 15 minutes and the exhaust has to be directly let into the outside into the environment and room ventilation should have 10 air exchanges per hour 50% relative humidity and temperature of 21 degrees celsius all this all these have to be strictly monitored next if you come into direct contact with eto while uh, doing ster- sterilization the symptoms include irritation of eyes uh, upper respiratory passages peculiar taste headache vomiting dyspnea cyanosis pulmonary edema easy abnormalities and even chromosomal aberrations as they are carcinogenic so the side effects of direct exposure to eto is very much so that is the main side effect of the uh, using eto and the time exposure so the time required is more and the side effects which when when exposed to eto is also very much these are the side effects of eto so then we come to the next sterilization method which has advanced after eto it is the plasma sterilization method or the steroid so plasma we know that the normal uh, materials ex- exist in three forms solid liquid and gases plasma is the fourth state so what happens is in plasma is a gaseous state con- consisting of ions which are positively charged and negatively it also has negatively charged electrons so they po- the charged particles inside the gaseous state this is used for sterilization so how we use it is usually in steroid which is the uh, uh, method that we use in our hospital also it 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 is used it is it works using hydrogen peroxide so hydrogen peroxide which is h2o2 is uh, stimulated by radio frequency waves and electricity so when radio frequency waves stimulate hydrogen peroxide they change into gaseous plasma and these gaseous plasma they work by different stages they actually denature the proteins so because of the free radicals and the charged particles so the different stages being first is the vacuum stage where we create a vacuum for 5 to 10 minutes reaching up to very low atmosphere very low pressures and then we inject 58% of hydrogen peroxide for around 6 minutes and this diffusion takes place for around 15 minutes which allows all the hydrogen peroxide to diffuse throughout the chamber then we stimulate it with using radio frequency waves and uh, electricity which creates plasma and then this plasma using free radicals actually do the sterilization so at the end we have to do air flush for 2 minutes which consists of series of vacuum and repressurization repressurization with filters so if you if you see plasma sterilization they have the main advantage is it it is again a method of low temperature sterilization it doesn't require high high temperature so again similar to eto all the heat sensitive equipments can be sterilized using plasma again it is very much time efficient it requires only around 75 minutes when compared to eto the eto cycle itself requires 6 hours and the aeration post the eto cycling requires more than 8 hours so the total amount for eto cycling takes too much so if you are if you are having multiple cases in between cases if you want to get the instruments and scopes sterilized quickly and uh, we have to get it back for a second case then the ideal method becomes plasma sterilization because it is very time efficient and the disadvantages being and the other advantages it doesn't have any toxic metabolite like eto sterilization the type, the metabolites are only uh, uh, water and uh, air so the end metabolites for plasma becomes healthy to the environment and there is no environmental pollution also 
so and the disadvantages being it is first it is costly when compared to other methods and then the volume that can be kept inside plasma sterilizers are comparatively less when you compare it to eto eto can even take up more volume of substances whereas plasma sterilization steroid includes a less a lesser volume of trace so that we cannot sterilize more amount at a quicker time and cellulose that means paper linens or any materials that absorbs liquids cannot be processed in the plasma so that is again a uh, disadvantage and any material that goes into the plasma has to be cleaned and dried before going into the chamber so anything that can have some moisture or can absorb moisture cannot be used next we go on to uh, chemical sterilization chemical disinfection methods so uh, till now we have been discussing about the gaseous methods and uh, autoclaving so ald aldehydes first chemical that we'll discuss is aldehyde they the mechanism of action of aldehydes include they combine with the nucleic acid proteins and inact inactivate them by cross linking and alkylating the molecule that means again using the alkyl group and replacing the hydrogen atom this can be a sporocidal agent that means a chemical sterilant anything that is sporocidal becomes a sterilant so this can act as a chemical sterilant provided the exposure time is given too much more than 12 hours if you are keeping it an aldehyde can also act as a sterilant so the first one that we use is formaldehyde or formalin so the commercial preparation comes in two ways one is a liquid formulation with 37% formalin 10% methanol and the rest being water the other one is a formalin tablet which can be kept and then it diffuses into a gaseous form inside the inside the formalin chamber so two forms are there and the formalin uh, kills vegetative bacteria fungi and viruses in less than 30 minutes but that that means the formalin will act as a high level disinfectant it will it will kill everything else in 30 minutes except for the bacterial spores which will take several hours more than almost 24 hours for a, a fully sterile and activity again the side effect of formalin being the fumes are extremely strong irritant and potential carcinogen again it has been associated with oral nasal and uh, lung cancers so for this reason uh, it is not preferable to be used in hospitals and if used it, the all the equipment that have been used by formalin has to be thoroughly rinsed next being uh, glutaraldehyde the next aldehyde that we use very commonly is glutaraldehyde which is 2% sidex the two solutions that we use the three solutions that we use very commonly are one is formalin the other one is uh, 2% sidex the other one is uh, steric solution otherwise the parastic acid these solutions the glutaraldehyde 2% sidex the uh, good thing is it is less toxic less irritant less corrosive so the, it is one of the best solution that can be used but again the problem is it will only disinfect it will not sterilize it will disinfect uh, the material is within 30 minutes but again for uh, killing the spores and acting as a sterilant it will require more than 12 hours it is available in inactive form that means it comes in an acid it comes as an acidic solution it has to be alkaline alkalinized by adding bicarbonate and the ph has to be increased from uh, 7.8 to almost 8.5 for it to become activated so once the uh, activation process has been done by adding bicarbonate it It, it has a tendency to polymerize so the effective the activity of activated glutaraldehyde gluta will last for only 14 days so it once you have prepared it once you have made the alkaline then it has to be used immediately it cannot be stored for a long time for storing purposes we have to store it in acidic form the advantages of uh, uh, sidex is it is not corrosive to metals good for lens instruments including our arthroscope uh rubber plastics cold it is again cold sterilizer so there is no heat involved in sidex so it whichever that cannot be autoclaved or uh, which is heat sensitive can always be used in sidex and the disadvantage is being it when exposed to healthcare workers it will cause irritation in poorly ventilated areas unstable uh, the solution is unstable so the activity level has to be monitored once you made it acidic and it always leaves some residue on metals and endoscopes it has to be thoroughly cleaned so uh, till now i've been discussing all the common methods that we are using uh, on a day to day practice for all the instruments so how to ensure whether we have actually sterilized them or not what are the indicators to check whether the sterilization has been done adequately or not there are three types of indicators first 
one is a physical or a mechanical indicator they digitally display the in the sterilizer equipment itself there will be digital displays to verify whether the parameters like temperature time and pressure which are adequate for sterilization has been achieved or not but they are not totally reliable the equipment can get faulty and they can say that the temperature has been reached up to the required level but which may not have happened so it is only a it is only partially reliable the mechanical indicators next one is a chemical indicator so for chemical indicators they they are of different types there are from 1 to 6 types so uh, one ke- chemical indicator basically means we will keep a strip of uh, paper with an indicator which responds to temperature or any of the ke- exposure to any of the chemical so it will change colors either heat or chemically sensitive materials then it undergoes a color change so they can be kept outside the sterilized sterilized pack inside the sterilized pack so it it varies so if you keep it outside the sterilized pack it is called as type 1 it is not very reliable so the, this is an example of a chemical sterilizer a, a, a indicator strip that we use in our institute uh, so uh, the if you see here the one which is written as sterad the one which has a red line this is used for uh, plasma sterilization so if we keep it outside the pack it only means that the outside of the pack has been exposed to enough st- enough heat enough uh, sterile uh, the uh, enough hydrogen peroxide so that then it changes color to orange so that doesn't mean that the inside part is sterile so then we started keeping it inside even if you keep it inside it has to be monitoring all the parameters some of them monitor only one parameter or two parameters then it becomes type 3 and type 4 if it monitors all the parameters which are required then it becomes type 5 so uh it depends on the amount of the the number of parameters that the chemical indicator checks for so then it undergoes a chemical change so once we open the pack we should check whether the uh, indicator chemical indicator strip has undergone the color change that is advised next the best one being biological indicator the third one biological indicator basically works by uh, for if you take any sterilization method i told you the order of resistance of organism so there will be some organism which will be very resistant to the which is most resistant to that specific sterilization method so that specific organism is kept as the biological indicator so for, for example uh, the geobacillus bacillus stereothermophilus bacteria it is most resistant to autoclave and hydrogen peroxide glass plasma sterilization so this bacteria what we do is we this is an example of a a uh, biological indicator that we use here so they they are actually put in a small uh, capsule like uh, container the organism which is most resistant to that uh, specific mode of sterilization is kept in those containers and they are kept inside the sterilized pack so once we open the pack immediately what we should do is we should send these containers for culture if the on proper culturing of these uh, uh, containers if the organism has not been destroyed that means the biological indicator is showing that the sterilization method was not properly done so if the culture as shown here comes as no growth or no, no color change and no growth then it means that the uh, organism which is most resistant to that particular uh, sterilization method has been destroyed so the sterilization method has been effective then comes the different types of biological indicators ideally for a uh, it was initially recommended that biological indicator should be checked at least weekly for age sterilization method but when we are losing several loads per day the the uh, protocol has changed that if you are using several pro- loads per day it has to be checked daily so uh, various types of biological indicators are also available which gives uh, uh results in 48 hours rapid read out biological indicator which gives in less than 4 hours and spore strips which takes 7 days which are not being used now uh this was uh, an interesting study which i saw in journal of bone and joint infection which showed whether uh, in during a surgery when we are on a critical step when we are using an arthroscope for a uh when the surgery is being done it has been go- gone half way through and the arthroscope or whatever instrument we are using becomes desterilized it fell down or uh, it has been desterilized so what is the next step that can be done a perioperative contamination of our uh, instrument our instruments that are being used so there are no set guidelines for how to go about it uh, in literature so what they have done is they took an opinion from uh, different groups of surgeons uh, the one part being experienced surgeons and the other part being relatively inexperienced surgeons which are which are experts in their own field 
so they the final uh, opinion that they have taken is the consensus that came is uh, one we can do a high level disinfection that won't take much time if we put in a uh, high level disinfecting solution like cytex then it takes around 30 minutes but it will never become sterilized the other option is waiting for it to be sterilized completely which will at least take 2 hours because even if you do a plasma or newer methods also it will take at least 2 hours for a complete sterilization to come and the other option being uh, abandoning the procedure and uh, if you are doing an arthroscopy converting it to an open procedure so there is no definite consensus it came out as 31% chose uh, uh, high level disinfection 31% chose uh, uh, sterilization and waiting for 2 hours or more and uh, the rest of them choose that we go on for an op- change of procedure plan of procedure so uh what i was coming to is in uh, even in 23rd world sterilization congress what they have discussed was arthroscopes can it does it actually require high, uh, sterilization or it can go for high level disinfection or not so that debate has all, always been there so the evidence for it is that in a study in jbjs it showed that a retrospective uh, study of 12505 arthroscopic procedures found an infection rate of 0.04% when arthroscopes were soaked in cytex for almost 20 minutes and there was not much of a difference when we compare it with the sterilization method so e- the next study also showed uh, a prospective study which compared e2 sterilization with uh, high level disinfection using cytex and the there was no significant difference between the amount of infection that occurred between high level disinfection and sterilization so uh, the the latest recommendation from uh, the update on 2019 the cdc recommendation also says that the ideal one being sterilization there is no doubt about it but uh, in, in case of arthroscopes which are also critical devices if if you are not able to uh, do high sterilization high level disinfection is also accepted as per cdc guidelines so uh, the once the senders senders were uh, the, they are not uh, open to having sterilizers like ETO or uh, plasma sterilizers or the newer techniques like ozone radical sterilization nitrogen dioxide they are the newer techniques that are coming up which are all uh, low temperature sterilization in such cases what we can do is we can go for a high level disinfection also which is accepted but it it will always have a uh, side effect that it doesn't kill bacterial spores so the take home message be the uh, the routine methods that we use is autoclaves eto plasma uh, cytex and formal so uh, sterilization is always better so if you take in consideration arthroscopy the scope camera light cable shaver mechanical instruments all of them can always be sterilized in eto plus eto and plasma which are ideal the side effects advantages and disadvantages i've already mentioned and it can also be done in formalin also but the problem being it is a uh, toxic gas and the carcinogenic potential is there and it has to be thoroughly rinsed after that and the ones that should never be done are scope camera light cable they should never be autoclave they will be the instruments will be damaged so never autoclave for scope camera and light cable and camera should never be put in cytex if you put camera in cytex that the lens will be damaged so that also should not be done the rest all of it can be put in cytex also all except camera scope light cable shaver instruments can all be put in cytex but you will only get high level disinfection and all the mechanical instruments can be put in autoclave the uh, metallic instruments which are heat stable all the mechanical instruments can be put in autoclave which is ideal because it is it is uh, cheaper uh it is uh, faster and uh, the, there are no toxic metabolites and shaver can be put in all of these it will tolerate everything and the references that i have used is the cdc guidelines updated in may 2019 the uh, infectious disease epidemiology section guidelines by health louisiana department in us and the asia pacific society of infection control guidelines sir thank you sir thank you govind a very good uh, uh, talk and summary um, you got done a good homework and you did uh, go and see what's happening here uh, very good <laughs> that was my planned question to you do you know what we do here you've already seen what's being done a few things that you want to clarify is um <clears throat> sterilization methods you you told in detail but for all these 
the instruments and those uh, uh, all these um, devices must be cleaned properly any kind of uh, blood clot or any uh, kind of uh, uh, foreign body over there will all these work when the surfaces are exposed to these materials if there is a clot the surface will not yes. be exposed so the depth if there is a clot within the clot it will still carry uh, live organisms um, or if there is a bone plug especially in these uh, cannulated instruments drill bits cannulated drill bits if there are uh, tissues foreign body uh, or bone it is not going to be sterile if you see bone uh, even if it's autoclaved you have to consider that as an sterile so how how to avoid this uh, going what do they do here a uh, proper cleaning sir the, i i didn't mention detail the proper cleaning includes first by uh, washing with a detergent enzymatic solution so that enzymatic solution has to be used for uh, cleaning all the debris including blood clots and any particulate material or uh, gross contamination which is present so the enzymatic solution will actually using friction as well as the enzymatic action will remove all the cleaning uh, will remove all the debris so after that cleaning and drying only it has to be sent for uh, packaging and then for sterilization sir. yeah and anything else is available uh, apart from enzymatic cleaning recent advances ultrasonic uh, uh, you mentioned by... about that uh, no sir the cleaning okay. part i didn't mention details <laughs> okay ultrasonic uh, cleaning is also available which is more foolproof but very very expensive so we don't have that but uh, there are other newer technologies which can but meticulous cleaning is very very important for all of these methods of sterilization to work you did mention about all of the methods and then uh, sterad sterad has a small disadvantage when it's repeatedly used for these cameras and lenses um, there would be deposition of these probable hydrogen peroxide deposition so uh, in the protocol you had mentioned because it's expensive you use it only when you want to use it on the same day uh if you want to use the instrument again on the same day otherwise eto is preferred if you want to use it on the second day next day because of 12 hours of waiting time which is required shelf life but i mean waiting time for the poisonous gases to go away so the most preferred will be eto but uh, sterad is the one which is preferred only if you want to use that instrument on the same day cannulated instruments and others sterad works better provided it's cleaned well except for cameras and lenses Uh, which will uh, show some attrition when sterad is done repeatedly that's the evidence which uh, we, had, we had discussed in some other class uh, recently i think much start from me said sir your point well, well, well done he gave a good uh, talk uh, about it which very relevant and important the my only question is the formaldehyde also you included i thought yes, formaldehyde sir. is kind of given up uh, Uh, it uh, used to be used a lot earlier and we used to cheat ourselves into thinking that uh, the sterilizers all the sharp instruments copy and then kept doing it and uh, uh, what, what what did you convey to us sir oh, oh, formal is only advocated when the sterilization methods are not available in centers where uh, sterilization methods are not available cydex and formal formalin may be used that is the guideline they have given sir in cdc but uh, it is not uh, recommended if you have a proper sterilization methods sir formal kind yes sir for formal sir yes sir how, how long should you formal in uh, for a disin on? for disinfection we can keep up to 30 minutes sir for, for informal in but for a, a sterilization sporicidal activity it will take up to 24 hours sir hmm so using formaldehyde in between cases for half an hour is that, highly unsatisfactory right yes sir that that is uh, advocated only when you don't have a sterilization method sir as a as a second option that's also uh-huh. okay oh. thank you i'm not wrong i'm not really sure uh, formalin and uh, cydex are uh, liquids uh formaldehyde is gas i guess which is the formalin yes. formaldehyde yes, the tablets yeah. tablets which we use that 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 becomes gaseous they come in two forms sir the tablet form as well as the liquid form tablet form is the one that uh, changes to gaseous form the liquid form comes in acidic uh, composition which we add bicarbonate and activate into alkaline form 
that is a liquid form both are being used sir the tablet form is almost obsolete now uh, there is no recommendation to use it nab it's also the inspectors are saying that is the uh, obsolete uh, not recommended to use formaldehyde gas chambers liquid um, ones i was saying so yeah liquids maybe uh, we can uh, it's still not obsolete sidex is uh, one which is current recommendation which can be used yeah but nothing much to add from what else you told but when the when the instruments falls um what to do that's an i mean interesting aspect which you tried to cover uh as in, in our system we have uh, so many instruments so we can use other instruments if there is an instrument fault but in case where that's the only available instrument uh, depends on how much it is contaminated so uh sidex is one option but you carry a risk of uh, infection so it has to be uh, decided by the surgeon depending on the situation i would put it like that graft falling is a main issue yes we had yeah. some similar classes earlier the graft uh, has to be picked up immediately and soaked in uh, solution clindamycin for 30 minutes and then can be used any doubts or any question from fellows go in the can answer your screen by the time yeah thank you sir not most retail can go on with the talk uh good morning sir uh, am i audible sir yeah audible uh, yeah good morning sir uh, today we will be uh, talking about coda equina syndrome sir uh, coming to introduction sir uh, coda equina syndrome is a neurological condition caused by compression of the coda equina unfortunately there is no firstly uh, agreed definition for coda equina syndrome it's a conglomeration of uh, signs and symptoms it is most important both in a clinical and from a medical legal perspective that the symptoms are specifically identified documented and acted upon appropriately Uh, coming to the causes for coda equina syndrome uh, herniated lumbar disc prolapse forms the most important cause where uh, 45% of coda equina syndrome results from these uh, lumbar disc prolapse other causes mainly include the epidural hematomas uh, infections uh, primary or metastatic neoplasms any trauma uh, post surgical uh, there is a chance of 0.08 to 0.2% chances of uh, coda equina syndrome Uh, there is also evidence that uh, after chemo nucleosis uh, procedures uh, coda equina results in uh, coda equina syndrome after spinal anesthesia uh, after the epidural hematoma formation can form uh, can cause uh, coda equina syndrome and there are reports where uh, with um, patients with ankylosing spondylitis and gunshot wounds also have coda equina syndrome uh coming to the variations at time of presentation uh, this study by uh, tandon and shankar in uh, which was given in 1967 they described the three variations of uh, coda equina uh, syndrome uh, one being the rapid onset without any previous history of back problems uh, second being uh, acute bladder dysfunction with a history of low back pain and sciatica and third being uh, chronic back ache and sciatica with gradually progressing coda equina syndrome often with canal stenosis coming to signs and symptoms uh, the most common uh, symptom being uh, severe low back pain sciatica often it, uh, it's bilateral but sometimes may present with unilateral or uh, there won't be any Uh, sciatic symptoms saddle anesthesia and gen uh, general uh, sensory disturbance these form the important uh, symptoms of the patient bladder dysfunction uh, ranging from uh, painful micturition to painless micturition and subsequently urinary incontinence uh, patient may also uh, have uh, bowel incontinence or uh, sexual dysfunction and uh, there may result in uh, lower extremity weaknesses 
this article uh, given by Nicholas Sturt uh, 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 gave us the red flags and white flags in Quadra Equina syndrome. Uh, red flags warns the dangers ahead and uh, is useful in diagnosing the treating patient prior to the irreversible neurological loss. Whereas white flag is a flag of surrender where it tells that uh, we are managing Quadra Equina syndrome late and we may have to surrender the patient to the condition. Uh, red or white flag uh, symbolizes epivocal symptoms uh, that features could be early or late of Quadra Equina syndrome. Now, coming to definite red flags, uh, bilateral radiculopathy and progressive neurological deficits in the legs, uh, these form the definite red flags. And definite white flags being uh, urinary retention or incontinence, fecal incontinence or perianal anesthesia. Uh, possible red or white flags uh, mainly include the impaired anal tone, uh, urinary disturbance, uh, which is unspecified, and uh, impaired perianal sen uh, sensation. Uh, coming to classification, uh, Corda Equina syndrome is uh, classified, uh, uh, mainly categorized into three pa three times. Uh, the first being Corda Equina syndrome, which is suspected. Uh, the uh, presenting symptoms in this category uh, mainly include uh, bilateral radiculopathy. Uh, there may be a subjective sphincteric problems, but no objective signs of Corda Equina syndrome. Bowel and, uh, there, were, uh, there will be no bowel and bladder symptoms. Coming to Corda Equina syndrome, incomplete. Uh, there may be a bilateral radiculopathy, uh, impaired perianal sensation, uh, subjective and objective signs of uh, bladder symptoms, uh, which is mainly a painful bladder, but patient still has a voluntary control of initiating and stopping maturation uh, will be uh, the important sign here. And uh, third one, third category being Corda Equina syndrome retention. Uh, with uh, the symptoms being uh, uh, bilateral radiculopathy with paralyzed incinate bladder with incontinence urine and there will be a painless bladder. Uh, coming to clinical evaluation and diagnosis, uh, coming to the examination part, the slate uh, SLRT will be positive and cross leg SLRT will also be positive. Uh, there will be a dermatomal evaluation uh, Depending on the degree of compression, dermatomal evaluation of sensory or motor, uh, motor neurological grading has to be done. Evaluation of the perianal sensory disturbance has to be done. Uh, distal rectal examination and evaluation of the anal tone has to be confirmed. And uh, presence of anal wings, uh, absence of anal wing sign is a, a sure sign of uh, Corda Equina syndrome. Another useful test, uh, which is not generally described, is the trigone, uh, trigone sensitivity test, uh, wherein which an inflated uh, police catheter is gently pulled uh, with patient being unaware. This should produce an urge, uh, urge to maturate, and this will help to distinguish patients from genuine uh, neurological deficits from those uh, who have purely pain-related uh, retention, which is not un uncommon. Mm, the MRI being the most important investigation uh, has to be done in Corda Equina syndrome. Uh, this investigation must proceed over all over uh, routine cases and uh, any delay should be clearly documented for uh, medical legal pur purposes. Other investigations uh, being the USG bladder to evaluate, uh, to evaluate uh, detrusor contractility or uh, post-vital residual uh, urine. Uh, coming to the evaluation of a uh, digital uh, rectal examination, um, this study by Sherlock and, uh, uh, in 2015, uh, they assessed that the overall correctness of uh, assessing anal tone using digital rectal examination is limited to 64%. And a similar study conducted by Datta S, uh, they confirmed that the anal wink was a good predictor of recovery of bladder and bowel functions. Uh, most patients with an intact anal wink at the presentation will eventually have a satisfactory recovery of bladder and bowel function. Similarly, uh, when come uh, coming to the bladder scans, uh, uh, this study uh, conducted by Venkatesh uh, et al. Uh, where they confirmed that, uh, where they concluded that for a uh, non-operated group uh, without any Corda Equina syndrome, the mean uh, post void uh, residue was uh, 100, uh, 199 ml uh, with a 95% confidence uh, interval, plus or minus 59 ml. And a post void residual volume of less than 200 ml gave uh, Corda Equina syndrome probability of 3.6%. If... Uh, 
if there is a more than 200 ml uh, residual volume then the probability of having a cordaikona syndrome is 43% uh, and a uh, post residual volume less than 200 ml had a negative predictive value of uh, 97% so they in conclusion they concluded that the bladder scanning was useful adjunct in the diagnosis of corda equina syndrome uh, since it had a better uh, negative predictive value than any physical examinations uh, coming to the timing of surgery uh, the urgency of surgical decompression has remained a contentious issue in the management of corda equina syndrome several studies have attempted defining the timing Uh, where the general consensus uh, is on early intervention uh, for improved outcomes and patient is well accepted however a result from various studies uh, quantifying a specific time range for improved outcomes has been conflicting uh, deteriorating uh, function on corda equina syndrome uh, patient is a continuous and a progressive disorder evidence that the duration of uh, corda equina uh, compression is a determinant of outcome with progression of neurological deficit and worse outcomes uh, since uh, the more the prolonged compression the more the uh, bad outcome for corda equina syndrome uh, come to the study 48 hours and its emergency and downfall uh, the study conducted by uh, in this paper uh, corda equina syndrome uh, it was a meta analysis of surgical outcomes where they analyzed uh, 30 uh, 322 uh, patients um, a significant improvement was seen in sensory and motor deficits as well as urinary and rectal functions uh, occurred in patients who underwent decompression uh, within 48 hours and they also stated that uh, no significant improvement in the surgical outcome was identified with interventions less than 24 hours from the onset of corda equina syndrome compared with the patients treated with uh, 24 to 48 hours this uh, another study by colles et al critically reassessed the paper and concluded that a flawed methodology, uh, methodology and misinterpretation of results are reported understating the value of early surgery they concluded that although an advantage existed in treating patients with 48 hours uh, there was further benefit in treating patients within 24 hours uh, when in coming to corda equina syndrome incomplete or with retention timing of surgery mm, glevens and mcquirrell stress the importance of uh, categorizing the corda equina syndrome into incomplete and uh, retention they stated that uh, corda equina syndrome uh, incomplete is best treated by early surgery uh, a meta analysis was done by d long et al uh, highlighted the importance of categorizing uh, corda equina syndrome into these subtypes and that early surgery did make clinically significant difference in terms of urinary functions uh, in the patients of uh, corda equina syndrome ret uh, retention group d long et al also demonstrated significant improvement of urinary symptoms when being operated within 24 hours in comparison to 72 hours again uh, timing uh, this paper in timing of surgical intervention in corda equina syndrome where a systematic critical review was done the authors authors concluded that there is a lack of discrete evidence supporting the 48 hour dictum as a safe time point to delay the surgery uh, the degree of uh, neurological dysfunction is likely to play a significant prognostic uh, indicator uh, whether it is a incomplete or a complete uh, corda equina syndrome uh, Cowork and the colleagues highlighted both early and delayed surgery may contribute to improved neurological outcomes based upon the individual's clinical conditions. So uh, finally, the author recommended an early intervention is more likely to benefit the patients with acute deterioration owing to the compression of the nerves. This is the another study. Uh, where they aim to investigate whether timing of intervention in management of patients with cs has an impact on outcomes so early intervention in corda equina syndrome uh, regardless of the subtypes has higher likelihood of improved uh, improved uh, in patient outcomes the odds of getting better were higher however with incomplete uh, uh, corda equina syndrome and the timing of intervention did not seem to matter in traumatic uh, corda equina syndrome as compared with a degenerative etiology corda equina syndrome with incomplete uh, neural status requires an emergency surgical intervention literature is abundant with reports stating uh, 
patient tend to show a favorable outcome from an early surgery. Uh, patients with incomplete at the time of surgery have better prognosis than with the patients with uh, retention and cauda equina syndrome. Uh, now coming to the management part. Mm. Surgical management is the steadfast with seldom room for any non-surgical options given to the natural uh, course of the cauda equina syndrome. The choice of decompression alone uh, versus decompression and fusion has also been under considerable debate. Uh, the principles of surgery uh, mainly being minimal retraction of the compromised dural sac, complete removal of the offending disc and the osteophyte complex, uh, maintaining the spinal stability. Uh, the surgical approach uh, is decided on following factors with the number of levels of involvement, uh, presence of associated instability like any spondylolisthesis, presence of any associated uh, severe central disc calcifications or which may hamper any dural retractions and prior history of any laminectomy and fasciotectomy is also an important factor. Uh, uh, coming to the deep, uh, decompression, la laminectomy is the procedure of choice. And in deep, decompressing a highly stenotic canal, it's prefer, preferable to begin the decompression at a normal or a minimal stenotic segment rather than to progress to a more compromised, compressed site. Thinning the lamella with a high-speed burr will facilitate a decompression by permitting the use of a smaller kerosene ronger with a, safer, uh, with a smaller uh, foot plate. Trying to force a bigger ronger with a larger foot plate in a stenotic canal can result in an inadvertent injury to the spinal cord or cord equina. It is essential that the ligament to be completely free of any adhesions uh, underlying the dura before it's uh, being removed. Uh, cones of depression uh, mainly being uh, there may be, uh, there is a chance of recurrent disc herniation which is about 25-24%. Uh, uh, patient may present uh, post surgery may present with chronic low back pain, instability due to extensive laminectomy. There is an increased chance of neurological worsening uh, due to manipulative neural injury in an already compromised uh, compromised canal, and it may lead to progressive stenosis, which is still debatable. Uh, Along with decompression, fusion should be considered in situations of uh, recurrent disc herniation and associated instability. Uh, other relative indications being a large disc with a narrow canal, uh, patient who has predominant low back pain, a tall disc and a kyphotic disc, uh, sagittal facet orientations, and to mi minimize handling of the dural sac. Uh, coming to the outcomes post uh, surgery, uh, does uh, in this paper uh, it was uh, by Srikant Rajan uh, retrospective study was done where early surgery for uh, cord icona syndrome within 24, uh, 48 and 72 hours of onset autonomic symptoms made any difference in the bladder function in the initial output patient follow up uh, decompressive surgery for patients within 24 hours so uh, with the onset of autonomic symptoms reduced the bladder dysfunction at the initial follow up they also stated that within 24 to 48 hours uh, does not alter the bladder outcome at the initial follow up which is statistically significant uh, patients with uh, incomplete cauda equina syndrome are five times more likely to achieve a normal bladder at the initial follow up if operated within 24 hours of onset of autonomic symptoms as opposed to the 48 hours this supports the theory that the severity of bladder deficit at presentation that may be a determinant of the uh, clinical outcome Uh, again, uh, cauda, uh, the, in this paper, the cauda equina syndrome with presentation outcomes and predictors with focus on micturition, defecation, and se uh, sexual dysfunction, which was a unique study where the data regarding the outcomes uh, above mentioned were character uh, characteristics are scarce. Um, but still, in this study, the mean follow up was 63 days. Uh, defecation dysfunction in this study found a prevalence of 41.8% at the last follow up. Uh, females were more prone with uh, defecation dysfunction rather than their male counterpart. And sexual dysfunction in the current study was 53.3% at the last follow-up. Uh, this study uh, demonstrates that recovery after decompression is slow and far from complete in the majority of patients with regard to micturition, defecation, and sexual dysfunction. Uh, in, in this following study, the primary aim was to assess the patient's uh, current bowel, bladder, and uh, sexual function. 
uh, this uh, the mean duration of uh, of uh, from the time of admission to follow up was 43 months and uh, they noticed that the bladder dysfunction in these patients was seen in uh, 76% Sexual dysfunction was noted in 39% and bowel dysfunction was less compared to the previous studies. Uh, patient with uh, retention cord icona syndrome demonstrated significantly poorer uh, low stream bladder function, bowel function and sexual function in comparison to those with uh, incomplete uh, cord icona syndrome. This is likely due to the most serious nature of the retention type of uh, cord icona syndrome, which indicates compression and damage to the nerves of lumbosacral plexus, therefore more likely to result in subsequent permanent damage of the nerves, which are mainly supplying the bladder, bowel and sexual functions. Another study uh, with, uh, showing the outcome of spinal decompression uh, the delay of uh, this was uh, this study was done in uh, india so the mean delay in surgery uh, was 12.2 days uh, the study found no statistically dif uh, significant difference in the mean surgical delay of uh, poor outcome group or a better outcome group they found a very strong uh, positive correlation between the delay in surgery and the duration of recovery uh, suggesting that uh, the late uh, uh, sorry, uh, the patients who present late would be definitely benefited by decompression, but recovery time will also be uh, significantly delayed. So, in a, at the conclusion, they concluded that uh, better outcome of uh, decompression of cord icona syndrome. Nathan, can you see what happened? Hello. Sir, it's automatic close-up. Close-up. Yeah, you're audible now. From your, audible. From your second device. Audible else? Yeah, from your second device. You're in two devices. Uh, then coming to... Uh, minimal invasive surgeries in cord icona syndrome. Uh, now, uh, with recent advances, uh, treatment of cord icona syndrome is caused by lumbar disc herniations with uh, percutaneous uh, endoscopic discectomy surgeries. Uh, there was a comparison uh, study conducted with uh, full endoscopic discectomy versus laminectomy, where they showed that with uh, uh, the results uh, were same. 
uh, with the endoscopic being uh, advantages that they have a lesser uh, blood loss and a shorter duration of uh, stay in the hospital. Um, coming to medical legal... You can see your screen. Sir? Your screen is not visible. You, you are audible, but your screen is not visible. Ah, one sir. Uh, now the screen visible, sir. Yeah, visible. Yeah. The medical legal importance uh, in Corda Iconia syndrome, uh, this is an important aspect where the rare a rarity and a variability of cardiac syndrome can result in misdiagnosis and delay by first uh, the patient who may develop urinary retention over a previous uh, six to eight hours uh, and they may not sought medical advice uh, until the situation is irreversible secondly uh, the general practitioner or the therapist who may uh, who they have uh, who do not have appreciated the gravity of situation and consequently fail the advice immediate transfer to the hospital uh, third being delay occurs in the hospital with junior doctors and nurses not recognizing the syndrome presented to them. And finally, uh, the non-availability of out-of-hours MRI with the specialist spinal surgical facilities, uh, mainly singly or collectively cause further delays, which may be critical to the eventual outcome. Uh, these are even more significant if there is evidence of progressing neurological deficit during this time. So uh, the litigation is common where uh, patient has persistent uh, residual symptoms and uh, especially if the clinical records is defective uh, and uh, likely outcome has not been fully explained uh, and understood by the patient prior to any surgical intervention. So take home message is uh, always uh, keep a watch on uh, Corda Iconia syndrome when, whenever the patient presents with uh, bilateral uh, radiculopathy and any uh, disturbance in the bowel and bladder uh, always uh, don't hesitate and can go uh, should immediately be evaluated and uh, MRI has to be done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to just to two things to add in eh? uh, uh, to the fellows uh, who are in OP or uh, who are going to see in the casualty and all, uh, just ask every patient for a uh, if they have any urinary or bladder symptoms. Uh, it may be constipation, it may be anything, but needs to be always noted down. Uh, maybe that will help us to see the thing. And uh, one more thing that you should you should suspect. Uh, is when they have bilateral radiculopathies, those who present with uh, pain in both the legs and uh, both the legs they are uh, suppose lifting only 30 degrees or 40 degrees in both the legs uh, SLR is positive uh, you should have a watch on and uh, another thing that we do usually here is we don't do an ultrasound uh, uh, guided residual urine thing the more reliable thing is, uh, is to ask the patient to pass urine and then Put, the, put a catheter in the patient. Uh, that is what we are following here. Right? Then uh, once the patient has feels that he has completely voided and after that, uh, when we put a catheter, we'll exactly know how much residual urine is there inside. Uh, that is what we are doing. Uh, that is small things. Then uh, uh, as you know, the, this early we have to intervene, everybody knows. At the earliest possible is the thing that we have to. It may not be possible like uh, all these 24 hours, 48 hours is only for uh, uh, Western countries and uh, where the country where they have all the facilities. 
in india almost everyone comes only after we have around seven cases inga rabi is going to look into it but none of the patients presented in 24 hours or 48 hours all of them present very late in our uh, scenario they come after being kept one of the patient was catheterized and kept for 15 days and after that they came so uh, whenever they come they have an indication for surgery it's not that they won't recover at all they always recover but uh, we cannot predict the recovery outcome uh, so quadriquina definitely needs surgery even if they present late uh, and it may not be uh, sometimes already it's 15 days so sometimes we may not be able to take up the patient at the middle of the night if the patient has all the comorbidities and everything we usually take up uh, even if we take them up next day early morning also it is uh, okay only it's not uh, already it's already 15 days gone another 5 hours or 6 hours of delay from 12 o'clock midnight to 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning is not going to make a big uh, difference and uh, all of these patients actually recover the most important part is, is most of these patients have got food drop so uh, motor recovery is always good uh, only thing for, uh, which is not very predictable is this bladder and uh, bowel uh, we yesterday we had a patient i don't know who saw uh, we had one of these patients who had a uh koda ipina who presented to us that uh, now it is one year follow up uh, he has recovered completely he, he is able to squat down uh, get up everything is possible except that uh, uh he uh, urine stream he is not able to pass it fast uh, like the way he has he takes a longer time to pass urine other than that his bowel has recovered uh, motor deficit everything has recovered so there is always an indication for uh, this thing and uh, there is and to sri shail this thing there are new papers coming up now where they do only endoscopic decompression also yes. uh, where they have again shown similar results but again it is very less the numbers are too small to actually uh, conclude whether that is really possible and for now it is uh, the standard is like you have to do a proper laminectomy and uh, decompression and not to go for any smaller procedure in quad aquina syndromes and it is mandatory to see both sides like uh, what we do uh, you must have all seen when we go for a discectomy we hardly see the lateral part of the root and uh, we don't expose the thecal sac we don't expose the nerve root completely uh, we don't see the uh, we don't have to expose actually and uh, which makes the surgery safe but in case of a quad aquina it is mandatory that you see the whole thecal sac you see the full nerve root in both sides so it may be a little extensive surgery but uh, that is what is recommended in a coda equina to get the maximum amount of uh, be- to get the better results uh, I-, i think sandosh uh, adhanga there are a few things yeah good, good, good points uh, sir ram when whether you do practice shoulder surgery or uh, whatever surgery is something basically you should know as an orthopedic surgeon now the, the uh, doubt maybe you know like it's stupid doubt also you know as a 50 55 years old person and uh, because of, uh, retention and uh, and both both legs slightly elevated feel pain uh, anyway by which, uh, which you can clinch the diagnosis and exclude the prostate uh, issue uh a difficult thing is prostate uh, is a possibility by the kind do rectal i'm sure Rect- uh, yes uh, anal ring kala paakalam sir they won't have any yeah. perianal sensory loss uh, yeah. they won't have a uh, uh, food drop and all because this 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 old people uh, if they cross 50s and all most commonly we what we see is a stenosis so they don't have any deficits so, uh, uh, they don't have any motor deficits they won't have any sensory deficits in the legs uh, rest nothing will be there sir except maybe this urinary alone may be the thing along with the leg pain yeah or or you saying that coda equina all the time associated with motor deficit uh, most of the time sir because uh, the uh, the s1 s2 s3 are the central most nerves in the thecal sac so all the rest of the nerves have to be compressed to reach the uh, bladder nerves which is s2 3 4 
so uh, by the time the uh, disk or uh, the compression whatever it causes the compression uh, compresses the s234 which are, which are in the central most part of the thecal sac uh, they will compress the rest of the things so most of the time uh, all these patients will have uh, uh, foot weakness uh, change in gait and everything before they develop a s1 s234 loss mm -hmm. okay. that is the central most so periphery everything has to be compressed before compressing the central one mm -hmm. okay. santosh here uh, regarding the ultrasound i mean if it's uh, adding a, a value why, why don't we do ultrasound in these cases edunga for residual urine it might help okay. us to rule out dph time time time, time 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 is a factor ena the moment the patient comes we ask them to pass urine and you put the catheter there at that in op itself we come to know he has a residual urine of this much he is into this thing he needs a surgery uh, to do an ultrasound we have to now wait for the radiologist time to come avanga vande avanga panni adukaparam residual urine iruka illaya all these things takes a very long time okay we can do that it's not that uh, we cannot do but uh, in our situation that's why i said in our situation this is what we do which the fellows can also do it in the op itself like the patient comes with this they comes a problem ask them to pass urine and just put a catheter so if the residual urine is in many of these cases the residual urine will come to something like 1 liter uh, 700 ml uh, it will be huge amounts in it will be completely uh, it, it's a it's a problem we are waiting for another 5 or 6 hours for the ultrasonologist to come or adalla uh, will will take uh, delay thanga basically mm. and uh, relieving that uh, 100 m 1 liter of urine from the bladder will give a lot of relief to the they, they don't even realize this is happening instead okay decision making is faster okay okay and more reliable than the ultrasound also mm. so medical legally will it be an advantage is my concern okay yeah, medical legally this is accepted accepted okay yeah, yeah. We, we just have to tell them that we don't have a full time sonologist here so actually this is what should be done also you don't have a full time we don't have a full time sonologist so assist the bladder thing we have done this okay. we have we have done our part okay so we have to make, sure, make sure that the patient is not catheterized immediately before assessing this huh. ah no before okay. assessing that's the question they should not uh, catheterize before making sure uh, this is done ah residual urine lengla mm because we have to I'm ask them to pass then uh, when we get the test they have to measure pass urine and then only mm. we should yeah. so all fellows please be aware of this for all spina spinal uh, or i can our cases please be aware of this yeah not only here wherever we go yeah mm. Nice class. Is Gopal there? Oh, you're, no. you're closing, uh, Sh Sandesh? Yes, sir. We'll end the meeting. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.